Welcome to Red Eyes Creations Radio. Thank you very much for tuning in. My name is, is Henrik Palmgren. This is Internet Talk Radio coming to you from the west coast of Sweden. Our website is redeyescreations.com. Go there, check it out for our news, radio archives, live programs, short films, links, resources, and of course our member section filled with material for you. And today we're going to talk about a very important story, uh, hidden from history, the Canadian Holocaust, the uh, genocide of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. We have Kevin Annette with us to talk about this and his film Unrepentant. And uh, this is available right now on, video, uh, on Google Video. We have uh, had it linked up on Red Eye, so you might have seen it. The uh, documentary film reveals Canada's uh, darkest secret, the deliberate extermination of indigenous or Native American peoples and the uh, theft of their land under the guise of religion. And Kevin Annette is a former minister who uh, blew the whistle on his uh, own church and uh, after, rather, he learned of thousands of murders uh, in its Indian residential schools. Uh, the website that you need to visit is hiddenfromhistory.org. That's hiddenfromhistory.org for much more uh, information, the latest uh, developments uh, for the film, of course. And I'm also going to ask a little bit more about the book Hidden from History later in the program about uh, that. Uh, so again, this is a very important story that has its roots uh, within the organized church and the government. It's going to be really enlightening talking with Kevin more today. So with that, uh, welcome to the program, and uh, thank you very much for coming on, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, where do we begin in a way? This is a big story, but I think the logical thing here is to start from the top. And, and if you can, for the audience that might not be familiar, with the story. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and uh, kind of the story uh, that you have been kind of uncovering for over, I guess, 10 or 15 years now, Kevin. Yeah. Well, the story really began for me in 1992. I had been ordained as a minister in the United Church of Canada for about two years, and that's the largest Protestant church in Canada. It was actually set up by the government back in 1925, um, but I was ordained as a minister there in 1990, and two years later, I went to the west coast of Canada uh, on Vancouver Island to a small community called Port Alberni. And traditionally, that was the spot where a lot of the missionary activity happened among the west coast native nations. And I didn't know that at the time. Like a lot of can uh, white Canadians, I was very ignorant of our own history, knew nothing really about the residential schools and, and what had gone on in them. So I went and um, I was uh, working as a minister there in the first few months. I opened a food bank and began to invite local Native people into the church. And that's when I first began to hear these stories of children dying in the local uh, residential school that had been run by my church at the time, the United Church, for over 50 years. I began to invite these people into the, into the church and um, allow them to speak from the pulpit, and we began to hear more of these stories. But as I, uh, I learned more, I found that uh, the church at the time was in no way willing to look at any of these things. This is before any of the lawsuits had begun. And so I was told in no uncertain terms to be quiet and not to look into this stuff. Um, at the time, I was married and had two small daughters. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of pressure being brought to bear that simply not to, not to look at these things. But uh, after about three years, uh, the boot came down, so to speak. And uh, after I had written a letter, I discovered that the church, uh, there had been a whole history of churches uh, that had basically stolen native land initially to set up their missions, then selling off that native land to various logging companies. And in this case, the United Church had had a close relationship with uh, a company called Macmillan Bloedel that eventually was bought up by the biggest logging company in the world, uh, a U.S. company called Weyerhaeuser. Mm -hmm. And they were profiting off native, stolen native land thanks to the church who was handing over this land to them. And that was a real concern to me because according to our church policy, um, you weren't allowed to do that. You were supposed to return the land to the native people and not sell it off to your white corporate friends, you know. Hmm. So I wrote a letter about that citing our church policy, and within four weeks I was just summarily removed from my pulpit. Uh, no review, no questions, no, no uh, cause at all. And eventually I was um, thrown out of the church altogether at the cost of about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, so, I mean, all of that came down on me in the early to mid-1990s. And as a result, my, my family fell apart. My wife left me and, and filed for divorce. And the church actually helped her in her in her lawsuit against me uh, in divorce court. She got custody of her two daughters. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, all of this was just it was a terrible thing happening to me. But as that happened more and more, I began to uh, learn more about why it was going on. And, you know, one thing led to another. 
uh, you know, the, the, we know that genocide, so to speak, has been going on for a long time. Uh, we can talk about the root of that a little bit later, but in regards to the, you know, murders that you've uncovered, uh, if you would to kind of give us a little bit of time frame of, on, on where we are here, so to speak, on the map, is this something that just happened in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, or, or does, does this, you know, continue to this day? Do you know, Kevin? Well, it does, con the high death rate does continue to the day, and this day, and it, it, it it's almost like the, the aim has always been the same, to get Native people off the land, to get the resources, uh, to keep them um, imprisoned in their own country, if you like, by by putting them in a, in a lower class of citizenship than anybody else through a thing called the Indian Act. Um, so that's always been the aim, but the methods have changed over the years. Um, the residential schools were set up in the 1880s, and they went through, they lasted over a century. The last one didn't close until 1996. Basically what it was is um, in the West, up, to, up until the late 1800s, something like 90% of the native population had been wiped out, mostly through smallpox. And the remnant populations saw their children carted off into these schools where half of them never came back. We found the death rate in the residential schools consistently for over 50 years. The death rate was around 50%. So, uh, you know, half of these children died off because of a practice even described by Indian agents and, and medical doctors from the government. Um, there was a very famous report by a guy called Dr. Peter Bryce yes. who studied the health conditions in the Western residential schools. He found that children who were sick with tuberculosis were being deliberately housed with the healthy, and then nobody was ever treated. And then, you know, they'd be dying en masse. We figured that over a century, over 50,000 children died that way. Hmm. And the government's even acknowledged this. Last year, they, they acknowledged the 50% death rate figure, and that's even being reported in some of the major newspapers now in Canada. But it's kind of like they say, oh, yeah, well, this thing happened, but in effect, nobody's to be held accountable for it. Um, you know, the churches who are primarily the, the ones responsible for that, they've never been held accountable. And no one has even ever gone to trial in Canada for the death of a child in a residential school. So it's an incredible denial and, and cover-up happening around this, even though they've acknowledged, you know, that, that these were very high death rates. But the, uh, the system, so to speak, I'm not familiar with it, residential schools, uh, define that for, for the audience that are not familiar with that. brought in in 1920 where every native child who was older than seven had to go into one of these schools and it was basically far away from where they live quite often they lived there full time uh, they, you know officially they were allowed to go home in the summer but a lot of the kids were just kept year long so I've talked to a lot of survivors of these places um, who tell me that they were kept there for 10 years or more and they never saw their parents they never saw their relatives um, and these were real really what they were were, were internment camps uh, the, the children received very little education. Uh, the formal education stopped after a couple